the field of immuno-oncology is an exciting one with multiple breakthrough therapies advancing for lung cancer. So far, we have one PD-1 inhibitor, nivolumab approved, and pembrolizumab is not far behind. But there are still a lot of questions remaining about the optimal way to use these agents. Let's discuss what we know so far. So now I'm going to ha have you take the lead on this and kind of give us a, a summary of the immunotherapies in your mind at this point. Right. So I think, you know, when, uh, when we first started to um, use nivolumab uh, was a, f a number of years back in the phase one trial, and we certainly had no or little expectation that there would be this magnitude of benefit. However, when the uh, first patients were treated with lung cancer in, in 2008 um, and activity was saw, seen, I think that there, there was a real, that's when the revolution began in terms of immunotherapy for lung cancer. So um, in terms of um, my view on the landscape of immunotherapy for lung cancer, I think that uh, in terms of science, it makes sense. Um, these tumors in particular, those um, relating to tobacco carcinogen exposure are like melanoma in that they are um, highly mutated uh, tumors, which uh, um, lead to T cell recognition of the tumors, but ultimately exhaustion. And these drugs basically do what they're meant to do, which is turn that recognition back on so the T cells can do their job. And uh, I think that uh, from the phase one to the phase two data, there's been a very consistent um, activity um, in about 20% uh, of patients. And uh, we, we finally had the first uh, positive trial in lung cancer, 017, that showed met um, really all of its endpoints and was, uh, showed a survival benefit in pretreated squamous cell lung cancer patients being randomized to nivolumab every uh, two weeks versus docetaxel every three weeks. And uh, there was a survival advantage and the survival advantage actually extended to whether patients were pd one positive or negative, which is uh, really a whole other discussion we'll, I'm sure, get into. So for, for many of us, and I'm sure it's true for many community oncologists, that you, you know, our understanding of immunology is relatively rudimentary. So Roy, I'm going to ask you, if, if you, um, you know, as being a, a professor of medicine at Yale, you get invited to uh, a first grade class somewhere in New Haven to, to talk to these youngsters about immunotherapy. How would you explain the mechanism of action to, to these uh, young people? Okay, for the first grade. So, <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about signal one, signal two, <laughs> and they see, maybe I'll leave that alone. Okay. Happy to, so what I would do, and what I actually tell my patients is say, say you have the tumor cell, and you have the immune system, and you, and you want the immune system to kill the tumor cell. But that doesn't happen. And why doesn't that happen? because the tumor cell's making a blocker. And when your immune cell tries to kill the tumor cell, it gets repelled. So what we're doing with our therapy is we have drugs, and we hope that someday you'll go to medical school and work with us, <laughs> and these drugs can take away that block, and then we can actually then have the immune cells kill the tumor. And that occurs in some, but not all, patients. It's a, it's a therapy that really is helping people who weren't helped before, I could tell them, you know, and give them hope, you know, not to scare them, but many patients are benefiting from this. Also, I wouldn't tell them this, but I'll tell you, many people are not. So, but I think this is, you know, you, know, you and I, well, we've all been doing this long enough to see that this is clearly a breakthrough, you know, that we, you know, that 20% of people who wouldn't be alive in six months are alive at three, four years. Now we have to figure out what to do for the other 80%. But the good news is we have these great new therapies, again, that can relieve that block. Is there only one blocker? I mean, uh, oh no, that's a, a gross oversimplification. And actually, what we're finding, some of the research we're doing, is that there are other inhibitors as well. So in those patients who are who are not, you know, susceptible to the PDL1 or PD1 blockers, there are probably other uh, you know, PDL3 or PDL4. Sometimes they're known as B7H3, B7H4. It's also possible that you could block these uh, these these agents as much as you want, but if the tumor doesn't have T cells, immune cells in it, it's not going to make any difference. You have to inflame the tumor. So we're beginning to look at different classes of tumors, and the nice thing is, through our patients, we can do reverse translation. We can learn from the patients and their biopsies who responds and who doesn't, and then we can take some of that back to the laboratory where we can develop animal models 
And this is uh, a lot of what we're doing in some of the research, actually, where, where many of us are working together on, on, on projects to figure this out. You know, I must say, having been in lung cancer for a very long time, um, we've never seen a hazard ratio for overall survival like we saw in Checkmate 017 in the squamous population of 0.59. Um, you know, all of our other hazards. And it wasn't, and it wasn't chemo plus something. No. It was something. It was, it was something new. <laughs> something uh, else. Compared to yeah. our old friend docetaxel right. that we've used for more than a decade. Right. It was, it was, I think that, that was great. Now, you have to look at, you know, and hazard ratio might not be the best way to look at this. What I would say is look at that tail of the curve yes. and those patients who are alive at one year and hopefully, you know, in this year at ASCO we'll see the two-year results. We have to figure out how to identify those patients early on because it, it does look like there, there are many you know, who are not benefiting as well. And if we could figure out who those are, they might need to get combinations of therapies and other, other sort of cocktails. Right. That's, I was getting to the point where the, the response rate was doubled it went from 9% to 20%. But if you looked at the median duration of response, I don't think it had been reached in the squamous population. That's the tail on the curve. Right. In patients who respond, they respond for a really long time. And, and even those who don't respond, don't you think, Nair, they, they benefit? You know, so you don't have to have a a documented response to benefit. Many of those with a stable disease benefit. And, you know, of course, you know, it's hard to make a case for those who are progressing through, but even some of those might have some benefit. So I, don't, I didn't like his analogy, by the way. Well, let's have yours. <laughs> so so I, you remember the movie The Matrix, yes. you know? And you've got those things that are going around scanning for, you know, for the spaceship, and you have to have the shield up. So I see these, uh, the, and what happens is that the immune system doesn't even, it's always scanning, right? Because it's scanning for viruses, for bacteria, anything that's foreign, any, any DNA sequence that's different, it's scanning. And so, you know, this is like the matrix where the tumor has this, uh, you know, protective shield, shield up. And so what these drugs do is, is uh, power down that shield so the immune system can recognize the cancers. The same thing on the old Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> I use a Star Wars now. Star yeah. like, oh, okay. I use the, the immune system is saying, the, the tumor is saying to the immune system, these are not the drugs you're looking for. Move on by. They're, they're all, all I, good ways. I think you might have scared some of the kids with yours. But that's okay. So, um, I have boys, uh, so, you know. Yeah, we talked about nivolumab. We'll, we'll, I'm going to come back to nivolumab in a moment. But there are other agents, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, um, the uh, AZ metamune component, I, ca I can't remember the name. At the, at the, yeah, 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 yes, yes. Uh, t tell us um, a, a little bit about the other agents. Well, I think that's what makes it, um, you, know, you know, even more exciting is that there are other compounds um, that block um, the PD-1 pathway. Um, PD-1 is uh, uh, the ligand on T cells. PD-L1 is what's expressed by tumor cells. And so the PD-1 agents, such as pembrolizumab and nivolumab, uh, bind to the T cell side, whereas uh, dervalumab and uh, atezolizumab bind to the PDL1 side. Um, bottom line is that they also show very comparable levels of activity. Um, the atezolizumab show how there was very nice data. Uh, the Poplar trial um, showing very, very uh, a powerful hazard ratio in those patients that had high levels of PDL1 expression uh, within tumor. So I think that. Um, I don't know that we can necessarily distinguish these compounds in isolation, but I think that as we think about uh, the strategies that are being used to combine based on a company's portfolio, but with their individual sciences, collaborations with us is, I think, differentiating the companies a little bit. So um, I think there'll be a lot of data coming out um, in, in, the, in, in the very near future. Every um, ASCO is really jam-packed with data. Um, I think that how we use these drugs in combination, the line of therapy, dependence on PDL1 expression will differentiate these agents. 